what happens is this will go for about two and a half minutes. It'll go for about 40 minutes. Probably feel free to interrupt me. Feel free to get up and go. Or if you have questions at the end, there's plenty of time to discuss it. I totally reformatted this talk in the last two hours, so it'll be a little, the first time I've given it. But what I decided it might be the most effective way to do it. Can you speak louder, please? Oh, I can't. Certainly, yeah. I will. <laughs> please. Uh, what I will do is give it the same order as we made discoveries and the same process by which we are working, because um, this this is like an update. It's an ongoing project with the goal of improving Doberman Pinscher dilated cardiomyopathy. And I've given this several times before at other national specialties. The jokes are the same, the data is different. Okay? <laughs> use the same jokes over and over again. <clears throat> okay, we've been working with uh, canine stem cells for about 12 years. We've tested them in multiple diseases and there are many, as you know, there's a stem cell revolution in medicine right now. We are using dogs and dog patients, and only dog patients. Some of the diseases we've tested has been, we tested degenerative myopathy. It's a spinal cord disease very similar to ALS. We checked, this is a rare genetic disease in children, lysosomal storage disease, and a very good effectiveness there. West Highland lice, they have a disease very similar to idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. In idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis is a disease none of you want. Your lungs start scarring. You don't, you, you suffocate from the inside. You can't breathe and eventually you succumb to it. Interestingly enough, Evil Knievel died of it. Remember Evil Knievel, oh, yeah. the daredevil? Yeah. He actually died in his own bed, basically suffocating. We have a treatment in West Highland Whites that seems to work. Um, <coughs> but what we've spent most of our time on, and this is the one that's near and dear to my heart, is dilated cardiomyopathy. And I hope none of you have ever heard of it or are familiar with it, but the incidence is about one, somewhere between 20 and 30% of uh, Dobermans have it, which means if you know five Dobermans, that means one of them will probably have it. If you've been in Dobermans for a long time, you have experience with it. The other thing that I should point out, this is becoming part of the miracle of stem cells, is what is discovered, and this was discovered by a friend of mine, Arnold Kaplan, at Case Western Reserve, which is just up the road, about 50 miles. He discovered that as you age, your bone marrow stem cells decrease. There are some people who are suggesting that maybe this decrease in bone marrow stem cells may be what we call aging. And that's scary if you think about it. I mean, from a standpoint of, yes, I can pull stem cells out, I can grow them, I can put them back in individuals or dogs, but if you're looking at longevity, think of what that's gonna to do to social security. <laughs> On the other hand, it's a whole new world out there, but then I start thinking about guys like Rupert Murdoch, by the way, do you know Rupert Murdoch? <laughs> do you know he's married to Jerry Hall? Do you know who Jerry Hall is? Oh, yeah. Mick <laughs> Mick Jagger? I mean, it boggles the mind. He's 87. She's 56, but that, whatever. Anyway, he will pay for bone marrow stem cells, I'm sure. Um, anyway, the way they work is still controversial. None of us know. We have suggestions. The first that we thought is number one, the green. We thought that we'd take these cells, we'd inject them into the body, they go to the heart, form cardiomyocytes, voila, new heart, we're done. It's not like that at all. I don't think anybody in this field believes that anymore, that they transdifferentiate <coughs> in. They work by many different mechanisms. Uh, some of them are secreting microbial growth factors, cell interaction, enzyme replacement, anti-inflammatory, and possibly exosomes are the leading five, and there's good scientists in all of those camps different experimental so we really don't know exactly how they're working and that's one of the goals is to develop a good system and then go back and work out exactly what their mechanism is. <clears throat> we do know and the one thing that we have seen in our studies with Doberman Pinscher dilated cardiomyopathy is we know that there's a positive interaction with a I didn't bring my pointer on the show. Yeah, does anybody have a I don't have a thing I can use 
of that. There's a positive interaction between the bone marrow stem cell and phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitors. Okay, you don't know what that is. A phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor, you probably all use it, it's called pimobendin. Pimobendin is a, a drug that we use to increase cardiac contractility. It has a mechanism of action very similar to theophylline, but it causes specific for the heart, and it causes the heart to constrict or contract more fully or, or stronger. And when you have a stronger heart contraction, you get more blood flow, and that's why you see a benefit. Uh, you see an increase in longevity. However, what it doesn't do is it doesn't change the thing. It makes the cardiomyocytes that are in the heart contract more, but it doesn't increase the number of cardiomyocytes. What we're seeing is we see that pimobendin somehow potentiates the effects of what we're, our product we call Regenity. Okay, dilated cardiomyopathy, the grim statistics. <clears throat> like I said, the experts vary from 20% to 50% of Dobermans are affected. There's a gentleman, uh, Dr. Weiss in Germany, he thinks 50% of Dobies are affected. But most people think about 20%. I don't think any of us really know because most of the data comes from university teaching hospitals, and by definition, that's a skewed population. So. With, I, it's probably safe to say about a third, 20% or a third are affected. Um, if untreated, once you have clinical signs, uh, shortness of breath, coughing, respiratory difficulty, um, uh, reluctance to exercise, what happens? 50% will be dead within three months, and 95% will be dead in six months. So it's a pretty grim disease, and what do we do about it? Um, typically what we do, well first off, they can die, dogs, can, dobies can die in two ways with dilated cardiomyopathy. <clears throat> what happens is the heart starts enlarging and as it enlarges, what happens is it, uh, the fibers, the cardiomyocytes die, the heart enlarges and it is unable to propel or pump blood as well as it would normally, okay? So two things can happen. One, you can start getting abnormal electrical connections around the heart. This would sort of be like if you had a computer and you started tugging on some of the cables, you'd start getting abnormal conduction in your computer. You get weird images and flashes and things. <clears throat> you have electrical abnormality, or if your heart doesn't pump enough blood, what it does is it backs up into the lungs, and then you, you build up fluid and you get very poor oxygenation. The estimates are about two-thirds of the Dobermans die of congestive heart failure, about one-third die of electrical abnormalities. That's the approximate estimate based on what Sommerfeld paper about two years ago. It's about two-thirds congestive heart failure. I don't know which is worse or which is better. One, you have to make a very difficult decision about your best friend. The other one, you just come home and find him dead. I mean, both of them are, neither one of them is a good choice, so we don't like it. So. The standard treatment of Lasix, the way Lasix works is it decreases the <coughs> blood volume so there's less fluid buildup in the lungs so the dog can breathe better, he feels better, and that's uh, what we use. That pimobendin is the, um, like I said, a phosphodiesterase 3 inhibitor. It, it's like caffeine. It causes the heart to get a little stimulated. It pumps harder. You get better propulsion of blood. It's a more effective way of increasing blood flow. And, but neither of these increase the number of cardiomyocytes that basically just treat the conditions itself, but they do nothing to reverse the disease. They don't reverse the course of the disease. <clears throat> How is dilated cardiomyopathy diagnosed? Several different ways. One is you have, you can use that cardiac x-rays, just take a chest x-ray, and if you see a heart that looks like a balloon, big round sphere in the chest, you say it's got it hearts enlarged. And that's the old way we used to do it until they discovered a cardiac ultrasound. When we have cardiac, this is what they do in the cardiac clinic. Some vets don't take the people back in the back room, I don't know why, but they don't. What they do when they're doing an echo is they take a dog, put it up on a table, and then what they do is take the ultrasound probe, the table is elevated so there's a clearance, they take the ultrasound probe, run it along the dog's chest. And the reason they have to do it 
it that way is they want the heart to follow in the lower chest cavity so they can put the ultrasound beams through it. When we, what you see is if you do measure dilated cardiomyopathy or whatever it is, you do an ultrasound, this is the cross section, you see the LV right there, that's the left ventricle. You put an ultrasound probe here, you shoot, shoot a beam through it, and you're actually measuring the diameter through that where it says LV, you're measuring the diameter of that chamber. And that's the left ventricle, you're measuring the diameter of the left ventricle. <clears throat> the computer then plots this with time as you, as you pull the beam on there, as the heart contracts, as time goes through, you get constriction. Each one of these, you can see a EKG here, it's a constriction of the heart, and you see a constriction, and they measure that, and they'll plot this, measure this distance here, when it's relaxed, and this distance when it's contracted. And they calculate it, they take the, it's called the end diastolic diameter minus the end systolic diameter, divided by the uh, end diastolic diameter times 100. Okay, everybody got that? That's the first test question. Everybody got it? <laughs> okay, what you do is you do this calculation, and this gives you what's called fractional shortening percentage. You probably heard that phrase. The dog's uh, fractional shortening is 16% or 20%. For a Dolby, normal Dolby should be greater than 25%. Typically what we're gonna talk about, dogs, all the dogs I'm treating are probably 14 to 16%. And what that means is the heart isn't squishing as hard as it should be. And so we'll talk about that. But that's how it's diagnosed with fractional shortening. Okay, what does the heart look like? Okay, the heart, what the heart looks like, <clears throat> this is a normal heart. And you see, the, you see the purple nuclei right here. You see all the pink contractile tissue. Pink is good, purple is normal nuclei. This is the way a normal heart should look. Okay, this is what a dog's heart looks like when it's got severe DCM. You can see, if you look at it, it's about probably 40% white, the white areas in here, and about 60% pink. Okay? <coughs> so this dog has lost 40% of its contractile tissue. Okay, it's severely compromised. Well, that's why I have this, this heart on the slide, is because the cardiomyocytes have died, and they've been replaced with scar tissue, and that scar tissue is not contractile, and it basically stops the heart from pumping blood as effectively as it should. Okay, <clears throat> this is, so how do we fix dilated cardiomyopathy? Okay, this is a problem that you have worldwide. In humans, what you do is you do a heart transplant, okay? About three, four hundred thousand dollar heart transplant. There's a few problems with that. One, there's about 12,000 people on the list waiting for a heart transplant. There's about 4,000 transplants that will be done next year, and about 8,000 will transition. Now, I don't know what transition means, but I think it means dying. So there really is a big problem, not only with dobies, but within humans, there aren't enough donors. And if anybody volunteers, I'll put them on your volunteer list to donate, but I don't think you want it, and nobody wants to donate parts. Okay, to paraphrase another solution with a solution that was done at uh, May Jacobson's institution, uh, a, an 80 wagers had came up with, and it was actually, I'm going to make fun of it, but it was actually a fairly important discovery. She came up with a solution that she could fix. This is what a young mouse heart looks like. This is what the old mouse heart looks like. And this looks like what it looks like if you take the old heart and you, tie, and you take, the, take that old heart and you take a young mouse a system called parabiosis. What you do is you line them up in your soul, you cut the skin and you sew them together so that they share circulation. Okay, out of this, sounds pretty weird to have an old mouse tie sewed into a young mouse, but what happened is we discovered, she discovered that if you fuse the circulation, young blood going through old bodies makes old bodies young. Well, this is pretty cool. This is cool. It actually hit the, a lot of the press about a year ago, two years ago, something like that. <coughs> if you think about it, that's neat. Except think about it from a different standpoint. I have a teenage granddaughter, 
I can imagine her tied to my side, <laughs> sewn to my side. I'd have to learn how to say, gag me with a spoon. Yeah. <laughs> what are the other things teenagers say? This is one of those where the cure might be worse than the disease. <laughs> so that, was not our, that was not our suggestion to go that route. We didn't think sewing a young doby to an old doby had there was much future in it for that man. So we found another paper from T. Chung Lee at University of Rochester. It turns out that serious hamsters <coughs> have dilated cardiomyopathy disease, not unlike dopamine pinchers. They're both genetic, they are well worked out, but what he had discovered, and I came across this, I think nobody in vet med knows this paper, interestingly, I don't know why, but, should. but what he discovered is if he, if he took, this is look at, remember, percent fractional shortening, I don't know if you can see it, if he took pig MSCs, bone marrow stem cells, and added them to these hamsters in a dose-dependent way, he got an increase in fractional shortness. And they went on to live and he had longer, and, and they did a bunch of other work, but he basically said bone marrow stem cells from pigs cure dilated cardiomyopathy in hamsters. And we said, well, that's interesting. I wonder if it would work in dogs. So our first dog was not so successful. This was a dog that, uh, dog that came in, you can see the condition of the heart, and you can see the condition of the heart is almost all, very little pink and almost all white. So this dog is 50% of the cardiomyocytes are gone at least. We later had some stem cells we injected intravenously, not in the heart, but intravenously, and the cells actually found their way to the heart tissue, uh, indicated by the pink here and the pink is superimposed here. This is actually, these are the same sections stem cells went to the heart, to the, in, in the area where there was pathology. But we said, this is very interesting. And so our next dog was a dog that <coughs> was a very interesting dog because after we'd done the first dog and it didn't turn out well, we had to put the dog down because of pulmonary inflammation, inflammation of the pulmonary tree. We then, we did, did, didn't do a dog for about a year um, as we're sort of considering weighing things, what do we need to change? And we came up with a list of things that we needed to change. I was in Long Beach at the AKC Championships, so probably six, eight years ago, whenever they were a long while ago. And Pat LaCour came up, she said, by the way, she did say I could use her name, so in that respect, came up to me and said, I want you to, I've got a dog, Gunner. And she said, you know, I took the history, Gunner is one of those dogs, Pat is an incredibly individual, incredibly conscientious, dopey person. She said, Gunner's parents were 12 or 13 respectively, I don't remember which was which, but they both lived to be 12 or 13. She said she thought she was safe with Gunner. She, but Gunner was showing signs of dilated cardiomyopathy. And I said, Pat, the last dog I treated bit went down in three days. And she said, I've been with Dobies a long time. I've seen it before. I know what he's done. I explained to her what we'd done. And we thought we'd checked everything and we were ready to go, but I really had to let her know that I may be more concerned about it than she was. And apparently that was the case. We treated her dog, we treated her dog, and you can see sort of the rate of decline. This is a longer, I think. Um, you, you can see six months before, he was at 20%, then he dropped to 16 where I was talking to her. She knew where this was going. As, as all of you know, a coffee and doby is not a good sign. By the time we got around to treating the dog, um, he was down to 14%. And he was exercising tolerant, was laying around. And so we treated the dog. I flew down to San Diego, we treated the dog, and wasn't sure how it was going to turn out. Right at this point, right here, I was in Madison Square Garden in Westminster when I got the best call I've had in a long time. She called me to tell me the short fraction had gone up to 17%. So we treated it, it went up to 18, then 19, then went up to about 20%. And we said this was great. It was almost the best news I had of a dog that actually went breed in the garden too, which was nice too. And we <laughs> that night. So it was a good week. But anyway, about three or four months later, she called me and said, guess what? Gunner's back to digging. And I said, oh, what's he dig? So she sent me a picture of, of, of Gunner digging. And so she called me and I said, well, <coughs> Beth, we try to solve every problem we can. 
<laughs> so I said, okay, Pat, you got a problem, your dog's digging. Well, let's see, we can take off the front limb, <laughs> stop using stem cells, or you can get yourself a John Deere tractor. About a month later, she sent me these pictures. That's the first one. That's Gunner digging holes and showing off his crowd work, and that's Scott filling them in. And so he was doing well, okay? In the store, problem solved. We just grow a bunch of cells. We just inject Dobermans. Everybody's happy. A couple problems with it. Well, actually, we had about 83% showed improvement. This clearly works. Can I ask a question? Sure. How often were you doing the injections? We are injecting cells every month to two months. Okay. And we extended his life for 450 days, which was a little bit better than Pimmel Ben was doing at the time. But there was a problem. We, and this is one of the reasons why we have to follow all these dogs for time. What happened is, it's not clear here, but after we treated him, his fracture shrunk and went up and sort of flat food is about, about 18, 19%, something like that, which is good. That's a good pet, Doby. He's at his activity. <coughs> normal, you wouldn't know he had any problems, you'd think everything's fine, unless you ran him on an agility or intense uh, exercise, he'd be a good pet dog. Problem is, we saw this, we not only saw the dog DCM, we saw it with several of the other diseases, is after about a year, there's a decline, and we started giving cells here, we started to try different donor cells, we tried everything we could, he eventually fell off the cliff and had to be put down. <coughs> we. And we'd seen this with some of the neural cases, we'd seen it with other diseases. So I think it's a property of the immune system of the dog saying these are foreign cells and we don't want them anymore. And we've seen it. So we, we went to a different approach. And the different approach was <coughs> when I showed you the work of Di Chung Lee, what I didn't show you was to point out is he also found that you took these hamsters and you did if you did treat them, they the fraction of short and they plateaued and they eventually died. But if you use the conditioned media or the media the cell was grown in and injected them into the hamsters, you got a similar response. Well, we hadn't really, you know, again, this is sort of those voyages that are sort of a lot of accidental things that happen for good reasons. So what happened is I was in, this was actually one of the few dogs I've treated in Northern California. I get a call from Allison, she has a 12-year-old Dobie who's down, he's in bad shape, she wants to try stem cells. Well, we went through, took a history, talked to her for a while. We didn't think she, the dog had handled a stem cell injection. And I went over to look at the dog over from Sacramento, I drove from Davis to Sacramento, looked at the dog, and trust me, I'm not the greatest clinician in the world. I could hear the dog gurgling, didn't need a stethoscope, the dog's down, he'd get up to pee, get up to drink and go back down. She would take the dog into work. She was a work swing shift in a 24 hour clinic. She'd take the dog into work, I think, because she didn't want to go home and find a dead dog with one of them. And two, she had friends who'd help her out if the dog needed things and stuff like that. And I understood that completely. And I had some stuff in my freezer that I had actually prepared for another dog that had coccidiomycosis that we wanted to, but the dog died before we got a chance to treat it. And so we said, I've got the stuff you can try. And she said, fine. So I drove over to the practice. I looked at her while she was a, the dog walking to work. Personally, I would have started to talk, doing the talk about euthanizing the dog. I mean, and I will tell you this, and I don't mean this as it's going to sound, but usually the last two weeks of the dog's life are not really worth living. And I think clients are slow to accept that sometimes as a vet, you have to not encouraged, but you have to look out for the dog and sometimes making that decision is the right thing. This dog was approaching that and I said, okay, so we, we left it with her. She's in good hands. The dog's down. She, she's a vet tech. I said, give it IV, give it every other day, this amount. And, you know, so I didn't think anything more about it. I went and said, and I said, what turned to Pamela as we were walking out, I turned to her and I said, if that dog's alive in a week, this stuff works. Well, I didn't hear anything. Okay, man, didn't work. That's fine. I'm not. I'm used to that. He calls me two weeks later. I said, "What's going on?" She said, "Dog's fine. Want more stuff?" <laughs> really? <laughs> so, I, so I said, "We got to see this." So Pamela and I get in the car. We drive over. Dog's up. Dog is a p 
pain in the ass. <laughs> the dog is up, he's going into trash cans, he's walking around, they have to tie him up, he's just not a not a you know great camper. And here's what you I had her write up a, a blurb for it, and very conscientious. Diagnosed with DCM, start on the usual medication, he had to be hand fed, severe exercise tolerant, able to walk in the end of the block, so turn, able to, couldn't get the car, he needed help climbing upstairs. She told me one thing, I didn't realize Dobies were that smart. I guess you guys know that, I just didn't. But the dog was so weak that trying to get upstairs, because she had a two-story apartment, she had a bedroom upstairs, the dog would back up and actually run at the stairs, and then she'd have to get behind him and give an extra push with the back end. And I said, I didn't know dogs were that smart. But anyway, she, he figured it out, she figured it out. But it, what happened is after that, you know, it began to improve almost immediately. He started eating, he started playing, I had great energy playing with his brother, Siv, great name brother, uh, regular spring and his staff started begging for cookies and treats and he did, and he was back to being, you know, reason, almost a normal. And on March 17th, unfortunately, his last day, he went outside, played for a short time, ate all the lunch, surgeon, erratic, and then came in, lied down, probably died the BPF, went into uh, ventricular fibrillation and died. Well, you know, that was the start of something, and like you said, you look at that and you say, okay, he did have his fraction shortening went up, if these are numbers, it's probably not getting anything to you, all the red ones are ones that improved in the way they're small change, we only bought him two months worth of life, is that worth it? Well, I can't build, make a million dollars when giving a dog two months of life, but it's the start and you start thinking about it. So then you go back and this is what you do in research is you critically say, what we do, did we do right? What did we do wrong? And so we started, and that's this whole start of Regenerate, uh, what we call it, basically the condition media. But he started at 52 millimeters uh, left ventricular, he increased by about two. His the activity increased, and again, that was just measuring the diameter of the left ventricle. And so that's when I said, you know, that we should try this again. And I happened to be in Cincinnati at a dog show of all places and ran into another dog by the name of Sonny. And so we treated Sonny with the Regenerate. We, we improved the method of producing, methods of producing, producing it and the yields and probably concentration and stuff like that. Sonny, Actually, was treated, started treating in year zero, and he went all the way up. We didn't get an we didn't get an echo on him until about the third month. But he went out for nine months on using Regenerate, and his activities were much improved. Um, this is what the owner wrote. Uh, one update on the last week went over, remained energetic. Basically, the dog was back to running on all eight cylinders, and. That was a very, very good sign. The thing that we had missed, the thing we had missed on this, and on these, on these is when Sonny, or when my James died, he went into B fib. Well, he's a 12-year-old dog, I wouldn't surprise him. Sonny also went into B fib. Unfortunately, Sonny would not have been, was not tolerant of mixilitine. It made him deathly ill. And so he didn't want to pass it away. So with that, we started looking at it, and then we started another dog by the name of Georgia. Well, we looked at Sonny and Bugs, we're doing very well, eating energetic, seem to be maintaining, and we started to get another dog, Lex, on the same sort of Regenovate uh, product. And shown here, Georgia got better, it's doing a lot better. But one of the things that happened, and this is sort of fortuitous, is when we started Georgia and Lex, Sonny passed away, started Georgian Lex. This is Georgia's ventricular diameter in the brain. And you can see it's about 50 millimeters dropped, a couple millimeters on the thing. On the other hand, Lex, we started using the same material, and his left ventricular diameter went up, meaning bad. So it's bigger, is, bigger is bad when you're talking about left ventricular diameter. And I said, well, I said, what the hell? We're using the same material. In dogs with the same disease, one's getting better slightly, the other one's not getting better, what's wrong? 
And so I went back and I looked at it and I plotted it out. I remember I was in Denver Airport at the time when I realized this. Lex was a 105 pound dog. Georgia was a 70 pound bitch. So even though we were feeding the same material, there's a difference on weight and dose. And so as soon as I realized that Lex was only getting a third of the dose on a weight basis than Georgia was, we then put Lex at a regular dose his left ventricular diameter decreased, his activity improved, a bunch of things we've since. We took him a little bit here, we kicked it up by 1.2. So what we're seeing is this stuff is very dose dependent. We had never thought that. Most people in stem cells, there's almost no existing dose data on stem cells or stem cell products. And so this is some of the first data you'll see. But this is all four dogs put together <coughs> on time. And if you look here, this is the diameter of the ventricle. By the way, this is a conventional. Um, green is good. Below 40 millimeters is good, actually, because we're talking about a hardcore cardiologist, you'd like to be below 38, 35. But below 40 is green, above 40 is yellow, and above 50, you're starting to get the red danger zone of having a dead dog, okay? What I also put on this, a lot of information on this graph, these are the months on therapy, conventional therapy, before you start to regenerate. And Georgia was just a couple of days, about 0.1 month. Um, Hijinx had been on conventional therapy for a month, went down. Um, Sonny had been on conventional therapy for 13 months. And Lex had been on conventional therapy for about 23 months. But yet, all of these dogs responded to treatment by decreasing the left ventricular diameters, basically increasing their activities. When we did sort of a, a quick t-test on this, and this is very exciting, <coughs> if you take this value and these values, the upper values, and match them with the lower values and do the t-test, you already get statistical significance in four dogs. That's very unusual, but it can happen, but we need to do more dogs as we gain more experience with it to determine what, what needs to be done. Um, okay, any questions on that? But basically what we're seeing is, is with these dogs, we've all seen a decrease in left ventricular diameter. And that means that there's probably better proportion, better contractility, the dog is getting their tissues perfused better, okay? The other way that Dobie's die of DCM is ventricular fibrillation. We, we investigate that, we monitor, we use wholesome monitoring to monitor EKG frequently in these things. Unfortunately, the dogs, unfortunately what happens is it's incredibly variable. But it does look like the same treatment does cut down on the, uh, the cardiac arrhythmias, but it's not, a, it's not a clear story at this point. Here's an example of the dogs <coughs> that we treated, that we treated with cells that had 17,000 PVCs in a 24-hour period. Holy cow. About four weeks after treatment, the dog was down to probably 1,000, 2,000 PVCs in a 24-hour period, and stayed between probably 2,000 to 1,000. This dog actually died, I'll talk about it in a minute, of uh, a very rare thing. This is another dog, this is George's PVCs. She was a mess, she was throwing about 20,000 PVCs R on T runs up to 60. This dog was a train wreck looking for a place to happen. This is after treatment. It's the same time of day, same, just a, a different, same time of day, slightly different ultra monitoring. Her, her number of PVCs are down drastically. The reason I point this out is no medical treatment is without complications. But so far, we've been very fortunate for the sophistication of this medicine. We're amazing, we'll be lucky. We did have one adverse response that I think uh, nobody anticipated, and that is, this is a dog that we treated three times with cells. The dog had responded swimmingly. He was back to, he was a 100 pound Dobie. He pulled, he pulled people wherever he wanted to go. And 100 pound Dobie makes him do that. That's a different story. Um, but anyway, what happened is one of we hypothesized that we treated him on his fourth treatment. I walked him out to the car. 
the dog, and you, you guys are not surprised at this, I was surprised, basically on the ground, caught air and landed in the back seat of an SUV. He didn't scramble into the SUV, he just caught air and landed on the SUV. Dobies can do that, they're pretty amazing dogs. This does, he was not feeling any pain, did not look like a heart patient. 10 hours later, the owner called me and said that pink stuff you ejected into the dog is coming out his nose. That's probably not true. What happened, what I believe happened is I believe the cord of tendonies of the, the hold the heart, this is heart valves in here, and these are sort of a fibrous network that support the valves of the heart. If you think about it, if you've ever lived on an old farmhouse where you open the door and there's a spring that keeps the spring door from <laughs> flapping against the side of the house, that's what cord of tendonies do for the heart valves. They keep them from everting they are structural that hold them together. What I believe happened is the dog's heart was beating that strongly that it broke one of the cord of tendony. And the cord of tendony, like, just like a chain, is only as strong as its weakest link. The heart was doing well, the dog was doing well, but that weak link was in the cord of tendon. I went back and I looked, and it turns out that yes, histologists find fibros fibrotic damage in the cord of tendony. In fact, in Pimobendin, in their original approval for getting a pimobendin approved, they said that ruptured cord of tendony is a possibility. So I can blame it on the drug or it could be my cells, I don't really know. Basically the bottom line was we got the heart beating stronger than the cord of tendony could handle and that was that. There's no way in medicine that I'm a veterinary medicine I'm aware you could do it, assess the fibrosis of the cord of tendony. You might be able in human medicine to do it uh, with some sort of an MRI or something, but an MRI on the dog is a pretty complicated thing. So, but basically our, our treatments are, are pretty safe concerning what we're doing. We haven't had a lot of adverse reactions. Um, and <coughs> almost all the dogs that we've treated have all reported improvement. This is a, that West Highland White. We treated a dog with West Highland White pulmonary fibrosis for three years with giving them Regenovate and the dog better and better and did well. And actually, after three years, it died of, and this is one of the things you get used to, died of sludgy liver. I don't even know what sludgy liver is, but it had nothing to do with respiratory disease we're treating. Okay, thoughts on dogs? They ask so little, but give it so much. You never have the unqualified love you get from your dog, especially from a spouse. Everything a spouse is negotiated. The most affectionate creature in the world is a wet dog. I'm sure you're all aware of that. <laughs> oh, oh. If you don't know what soap tastes like, you've never washed a dog. <laughs> but most importantly, and I wanted to ask you guys, do Dobies think that Putin's a member of a weird religious cult? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you probably do. So, anyway, this research was supported by the DPCA, and they are doing good things for Dobies everywhere. It's an ongoing process. I mean, we're still not satisfied. We have improved it a lot. Um, should point out that Georgia, the dog that we were talking about, with, was that 18 months ago was throwing 20,000 PVCs and its, its heart was at 50, about 50 millimeters in diameter sitting right there. Does that, if that looks like a do, uh, cardio case to you, you can look and see. Sunny, which was the most important thing we learned probably, is that this medication be, can be administered sub-Q. Now I'm probably going to get kicked out of my profession because as a veterinarian, the first thing we need to do is get the vet out of the recipe. Because if you have to, and I've had people do it, if you have to take your dog into the vet to have it treated, they're going to have to charge you, and if you have to charge you, then it's going to cost a lot of money. Um, Carol will at some point, did you bring this stuff? To show you, she worked out her own techniques for doing sub Q injections. I, I told her a little bit about how to hook up holder monitors. She picked it up on her own. Told her about doing sub Q injections. Uh, her vet helped her with it a couple times. And now, she, as I told her 18 months ago when she was very nervous about it, I said, in, in six months, you'll be doing a one hand and talking on the cell phone <laughs> when the dog walks by. And she's just about, she's just about <laughs> that. So, if you have any questions for me or Carol, she can tell you on what the dogs have seen, what, what she's noticed, what she's seen in the dogs. But we have two more dogs that are out. Uh, they said George is out 18 months, Lex is out. 
15 months, and they're both, oh, I didn't point that out. There's a picture, a picture in there of Lex catching air. Lex uh, was, was, he used to be one of those dobies, he threw the ball until your arm got tired or fell off, whichever came first. Then he stopped, I didn't realize, they are, those are very smart dogs. What he would do is he'd catch the ball twice and then he'd walk off and sit over in the corner with the ball. But he's back to having you throw the ball until your arm falls off. So he's feeling good. I don't think we'll ever get the heart size down to normal because of all that scar tissue, although actually I'm thinking about some MRI study with some dogs, that's a different story. But I, I think they'll always be have scar tissue in their heart, but I think hopefully the goal of modern regenerative medicine is to keep them alive long enough they die of something else. And right now I'm more worried about Georgia running in front of a FedEx truck delivering to Regenerate than I am worried about her dying of DCMs. How old are these dogs, and how soon did you get them on the road in relation to their cards? Uh, different, <coughs> different times. We get, uh, Joe, how old is Georgia now? Georgia is almost seven. Almost she's, seven. Yeah. So, she, she, so she's been with six when we started. This was actually the first diagnosis of DCM with Georgia, and that's why I put those numbers in the parentheses on that. Because, but and on the other hand, Lex has been treated with pimobendin in the usual for 23 months, and we started, and you know, we didn't think he was in, in, in as bad a shape. Um, but Georgia, like I said, was 20,000 PVCs and a huge heart, and I don't know why Carol was out for lunch and didn't notice it, but she really wasn't, she really wasn't showing any symptoms, I don't think, was no, she? No, no, she wasn't. And she was diagnosed in just the general wellness exam, and the vet <coughs> could hear. But was she close to heart failure at the time that you started it, or was uh, she occult? She did not have congestive heart failure, but she had severe arrhythmia, and we took her for an echo, and that's when we found out that she also was severely enlarged. And so we just started her right away, we because we'd been doing Sunny, this Carol's other dog who died of, of B. Fib, and he primarily was because he was intolerant of mixility. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what, what I just, are you then just accepting dogs, I mean, are you encouraging people to call you and try at, to get At this point, we're trying to be very specific on the dogs. We want to hone down the, what we want to do is run, sit, in fact, this is a, there's two problems here that I think where your question's going. One, we have to do this in rigorous, scientific, publishable material that'll stand peer review. And then there's a lot of people who have dogs that have dilated cardiomyopathy. We have provided medications for to owners for them to treat, but they may not enroll them in our trials. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the sort of the way we're headed because the ones that we enroll in our trials, they have to be echoed the first three months, every month for the first three months and every three months, because as you see those dots on those diagrams, they mm -hmm. have to be there. Right. And it's not, well, I'm going to Europe for the week for the month, so I can't get an echo. No, that's not one of the yeah. choices. And on the other hand, I, you know, as a veterinarian, I don't ever want to leave any dog untreated. Right. And so I, I it's something Balance. I'm grasping. And just a, what more can the DPCA do to support this research? The one thing that I think you need, and I think it's not the DPCA. The DPCA's job is to put on shows and things, but the, <laughs> but they didn't, they're not an NIH. They don't have. I mean, they have deep pockets. They have lots of money, right? Mimi, she just came in. They have lots of money, but the reality is there's limits to what they can do. What you can do is raise money, send it to the Health Foundation, or the Health uh, DPCA Foundation. That's one thing. What we really need at this point, I think, is a deep pockets doby owner. Um, I can tell you some cute stories when we get to the bar. I can tell you some cute <laughs> stories about some of them I've tried to talk to. Um, deep pockets doby owner to sort of under bankroll the whole thing. I don't think the DPCA has, I don't know what they've got for resources, but right. that would be, if they can use their vast network of contacts, that would be probably the ideal. That you, because I have two things. I have the, the science and then I have the production. You know, we're just producing this material. Once you produce this material, I can show any of you how to do a sub-Q injection in about five minutes. Right. And, uh, so, so what's, uh, taking aside all the echo, the holders, and all the other testing that had to, that would have to occur. What is the monthly cost to an owner for the injection itself? And is it da is it daily? What, how often you? We're doing it daily now. It seems smaller doses daily seem to be better. Typically, 
I can, well, that's one of the things I'm grappling with. I think I can reduce it for 50 cents to a dollar an ml. And what's an average subsidy dose for us? About 20 ml. For, so for you're looking seven about seven plus seven thousand dollars a year. So that's not insignificant right. for Adobe owner. I mean, and we're trying to figure out how to do it. Maybe if I get more scale, I can cut it down. I, I honestly don't know. You know, it, it, I didn't start out. This, is, although we're a private company, we're not. It, 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 a profit wasn't loaded. You know? right. And so, so we're trying to figure out how we can cut production costs and at the same time increase the availability. Which is our, our challenge right now. So it's like three hundred dollars. I'm just trying to do that. It's about 7,000 ml a year, which would be about $7,000 in a buck an ml. Uh, 50 cents an ml would be about 3,500. And so that's what we're trying to figure out if we can cut it down. We're increasing my yield of cells, each donor dog, stuff like that. So, mm -hmm. any other questions? Sure. Are, are dogs being accepted in this program throughout the United States? You, you keep mentioning California a lot. Is this East Coast, West Coast? Actually, one of the things, the first things that we learned was Sunny. We learned a lot of things with Sunny. Besides, <laughs> one of the things we learned is we had to be on guard for B5, which we, I wasn't anticipating at all in, in controlling contractility. We can literally treat a dog wherever a FedEx truck goes, although there's caveats there because if we send material out, we've learned that it is temperature sensitive. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is I take it to the Sacramento airport, catch the last flight out with a cold bag in it, and the client has to go pick it up. Not necessarily, you can have it delivered to your house. We prefer you go to a FedEx center, but actually you usually isn't that far from your house. You know, you know there's a shipment coming in, you can usually pick it up after seven o'clock in the morning. And that, that way it's usually still cold or still frozen. But is the monitoring done by a designated cardiologist? Yeah, we, we're using board certified cardiologists okay. because they have the expertise to do it. And we try to use the same cardiologist, the same machine, the same everything to cut down. As you can see, that undulation around there, variance is the bug of the science. And we try to minimize that as best we can. Since you determined that it's possible that the pillow bending caused the death of one of the dogs, are you changing how you're administering? No, I, I don't. I don't think we can. I think that is the where you have that's a corded tendony, where you have fibrosis in a corded tendony. I think, okay, for me to to know your dog didn't have fibrosis of corded tendony, we'd have to anesthetize your dog, put it in an MRI, which is probably pretty pricey. Putting a, a cardiac dog under anesthesia would be a risk, and I, I think you're better off just assuming it's one in a thousand and assuming your dog isn't one in a thousand. Got a question from Facebook. Are you looking at related Dobermans for comparison? We haven't done that yet. I mean, we are trying to do that. We're actually, the main thing we're trying to do now is, right now, is to do genetic testing because if we can find the genetic, the testing status based on the Muir's genes, that will help us. Let's say it worked in dogs with DCM1 but didn't work in dogs with DCM2, then we would know not to treat dogs with DCM2 and it would save us a lot of time. At this point, I don't think that's going to be the case and I also think this is going to be much more global. I suspect the same treatment will work in humans. I think it will work in any breed, in fact, uh, with dilated cardiomyopathy. And what just saying, the Irish Wolfhound group is very interested in it, but they're so damn big. I mean, they're 160. They, mm -hmm. they take twice the amount that a uh, that Adobe would take, basically. Um, and this is because of where I'm from. Chagas disease is is becoming more of an right. issue. Uh, I know of a Great Dane litter where they caught it in utero, and the fifth puppy is about to die mm -hmm. at five months of age. Um, do you think this is something that could be done in conjunction with treatment of Chagas disease? Is that something you're, you have even looked at? We haven't looked at I think it will work, and I'll tell you why. I, what I think happened, and this is not saying anything good about the, I don't want to say anything bad about the vet profession, but many times we're not as critical as we could be. Pimobendin or theophylline or caffeine all work through second messengers. What we, nobody's ever asked is what is the first messenger? I believe that what is in Regenovate is the first messenger that stimulates, and so I think they work synergistically. 
together, and it probably would work in Chagas. I think they use Pimo Bend in Chagas, don't they? Um, I, actually, they're doing, I uh, believe, a, there's an antibiotic oh, yeah. well, involved, a and a yeah, and I think that enalapril is one of the things that they're yeah. using with the dogs with Chagas. I, I'd I've have to go back and read. It. I know it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a parasite, that, it's also in humans in Brazil. Right. Right, but it has moved north. It is in the United States. And, um, I mean, we're looking now in our area at testing for that annually. Yeah. What is your area? Texas. Oh, good. Yeah. But it's, all, it's in all the southeastern states. I, I thought you were from UC Davis. And the research was done there, and then I thought I heard you say something about a private company. No, okay. What happened is I just retired from UC Davis in June to start working on the problem transition. I'm now a professor emeriti, which means I think I'm over the hill or something. I don't know what it means. <laughs> but anyway, no, it, it's universities don't move as fast as we did. Okay. So there is now a private. Yeah. I have a private and what's company. the bottom line, do you think, on the big pocket dough boner? The big what? The, the big pocket line. dough boner. What In other words, what kind of, big, how much do you line? need? I think There's a couple hundred thousand would be great if we could do it to allow you to set up I, you know, I don't know. I mean, it's one of those things. How big is the problem in the Adobe community? Nobody has it in any of their lines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you didn't know that? They, yeah. Yeah. I've never, I've never I had it. No. One of the yeah. people said I could, this is a friend of Pat, of course, who said I could use her name. And she, like I said, she did due diligence. Gunner's dad and mom were 12 or 13. I don't remember which was which. And she was a very conscientious. She's about as good an Adobe person as you can find. Mm -hmm. You probably agree with that. Absolutely. Yeah. You had mentioned the stem cell research and everything like that, and we just briefly touched on wobblers uh, this morning, and you had said that you thought there was some uh, work being done on stem cells and wobblers. I, I'm not familiar with it. I would believe, we thought about it. I actually had one of the world's experts on diagnosing wobblers from Ohio State, interestingly enough, out in UC Davis. Uh, giving a seminar, and we had done one dog that we thought was degenerative myelopathy that had a protruding disc that was causing pressure necrosis on the spinal cord, and it actually got, it, it arrested, it didn't progress anymore, and then about a year later it started progressing, so we gave it another shot and did fine. And it was necropsy at the University of Florida, Bill Castleman, it was a pathologist, and he told me, he checked the cord, and he said that what had happened, there was a disc pressure on the cord. Now, Wobbler syndrome is caused by pressure, can cause on damage and trauma to the cord as, it, as it, the vertebrae are unstable. Based on, on uh, turbo, I would guess that these cells would help in unstable, uh, where there's trauma to the cord. I can't say that, you need to do the science, but mm -hmm. it, it sure. would not, I would not be amazed if you told me you tried it in your dog and it works, I'd say, yeah, I, I would suspect it would. Mm -hmm. I believe these cells are reparative cells that go throughout the body that repair a lot of things. And I think um, uh, Carol will tell you, her dog, and I don't know if this, can, there is a thing called placebo effect where everybody wants to see something that works. But she swears up and down that the hair on the dog has gotten softer. And I'm thinking, of, well, you know, I, I didn't have it before to compare. I can't say as I've objectively mm -hmm. seen it. I believe she's not making it up, but you know, respect it, it is and so if you told me a wobbler you treated a dog with wobblers and it got better then I, I certainly think about it thank you another question from facebook and kind from of like facebook, what what's mark zuckerberg want now um <laughs> do you know donald levinson no no okay I, i'm guessing that's probably somebody that's doing stem cell research probably. in some other area and yeah. i don't know have you treated any dogs in the occult phase or, or are you waiting is with what treated any dogs that are in the occult phase that maybe aren't even ready for, for well that's what yet. we thought we were doing with Lex because his, his heart was so we started him in a very low well that was uh, trust me any big pharma company what any big pharma company wants is a small daily dose for the life of the dog I've got you you know I've got you that's what I can do so we wanted to look at a prophylactic dose so that's what we started Lex on and he proceeded to get worse and then we kicked up the dose three quarters and he got better. So whether it will work prophylactically, I don't know. I, our first experiment said it didn't look like it would. So it, it, 
but we were thinking that same way, and we may know more about it as time goes on. Any more questions? Cards? Sorry? Cards? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But it's, it's a very interesting thing. Like I said, it's a work in progress. I'd like to say I have all the answers. I know everything. And that's, that's why I presented it this way. Is each dog that we've done, we've learned something. Some dogs, the one that popped the port of tendony, we were not expecting that. And so there are surprises. This is not, and it's required that I tell you this, this is not standard of care. It's an experimental therapy. But it is showing, in my opinion, very great promise. I will tell you this, I did use it on my own dog. I, was, I had a five-time national champion canine dog, um, and he developed a meningioma, a brain tumor in the, in the, and there's a report of a group out of Italy that said if you take these cells and you soak them in anti-cancer medication, you inject them, the, it shrinks tumors. So we tried it. I mean, where, where else in the world are you going to get a veterinarian with unlimited access to stem cells who has a dog with a brain tumor? So we tried it. I don't think it worked at all. I wouldn't do it again. And I wish I hadn't done it to my dog, to tell you the truth. But it, at the same time, that's, there were five or six papers that said this works. And so we tried it. Do you harvest these stem cells from the individual dog? No. Sure. What we use, we originally used to, we used to do it big word is autologous. We used to do autologous cells. What we found is that when we do old dogs, that's greater than age six, we get incredible, we used to have, the way I harvest bone marrow isn't your standard uh, uh, oncologist bone marrow stick. The way we do bone marrow is we actually drill into the bone marrow. We pretty aggressively go after it. And so it requires anesthesia. And so to anesthetize an older dog, put them through that, and then we would get yields for about 50, 60 million. And I said, this is not going to do it. One, it costs a lot of money to anesthetize a dog and do surgery, and the yields are terrible. So we started using shelter dogs that are put down. We use the, our primary, our donor that we use is basically a two-year-old, two, one to two-year-old pit bull that's been put down. That's had, uh, no fevers, no discharges, healthy, but it's put down because he's a pit bull, which is a tragedy because I love pit bulls, but that's a different story. That's a social problem. That's not anything I can do about it. But they, we get good yields. We get probably the best cells in the business because of the, I mean, they're very, they grow very vigorously. They are very healthy looking cells. And, um, but we originally started with autologous and then we just said it's not going to do it. And, and I don't think we could go back. We looked at probably 10 different ways of harvesting bone marrow cells from a patient. All of them are very brutal, very pain, would be very painful, and uh, I don't think they're as good as the cells we grow from donor dogs. How quickly um, post-mortem do you have to attain this, and is there any, there is no effect of the euthanasia solution on the? No, no. Okay. But we usually harvest them within 12 hours. Okay. Oh, do you want to do you want to see Georgia? Do you want to bring Georgia up here? Yeah. Have a jump up on the table. <laughs> 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 do somersaults. Uh, no, you would not guess her as a heart patient. The last time we were actually very excited to see what we did most recently, and we're probably still at the low end of dose, is we kicked her up about 20% more. And Carol was saying that. Last week, there was, she was on squirrel patrol in the backyard. Wouldn't keep the, the squirrels. So, and she tr actually tried to climb. She didn't try to climb the tree. She leaped up, caught air, trying to get a squirrel. And was saying bad things about her. So, and, and so she. And all intents and purposes, she's not breeding stock, but she's a good pet, and that's what. Mm -hmm. the and that may be a problem that the DPCA has in the future, because if you have an artificial way of keeping them alive. Okay, you got 300,000 in Adobe and, and, and competing, and you find he's got DCM, you're going to keep him going for that investment, or are you going to retire him? But it all comes down to morals and ethics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like everything yeah. else that you can modify yeah. in an animal yeah. and hide. Yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. So, in that regard, I, you know, I'm not going to answer one way or the other. But. You want to chair? Oh, no. I just. I've gotten creative because my husband used to hold the dog for me, but I got really tired of uh, 
Sorry, guys. I'm talking to the people that are watching. What gauge needle do you use? This is a 20 gauge, one inch. So 20 by one. And I'm, this is how I do it, just to hold her head steady so she's not dipping her head. Do the pet insurance companies cover this? Do the pet yes. insurance companies cover this, or do you I don't know? think so. I don't. It's it's, it's, it's experimental. experimental. They, they would argue that it's experimental procedures. I don't think they would. No. So, any more questions? As we go to the bar. Thank you.